For whom? I'm going to ask Chris. and have at least 10% support among registered voters as reflected by a reputable, experienced, and independent poll. Here are the ground rules. <coughs> the moderator will ask the questions. The editorial content of the questions has been determined by our editor. Oh, boy, John. Limited to 30 seconds each. 30 seconds each candidate will be allowed to pose one question directly. Major funding for NJ Decides Debate Night is provided by NJM Insurance Group. Two-term incumbent, member of the House Financial Services Committee and bipartisan heroin task force, Republican candidate Tom MacArthur is President Trump's biggest supporter in the New Jersey delegation. Former director of Iraq for the National Security Council during the Obama administration and advisor to Generals David Petraeus and John Allen in Afghanistan, Democratic candidate Andy Kim is hoping to ride a blue wave, both running for a seat in the 3rd Congressional District facing off tonight with the midterm election less than a week away. Live from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is the debate for the 3rd Congressional seat. Good evening. I'm Mary Alice Williams. And I'm Michael Hill. NJTV is honored to host this debate ahead of the November 6th midterm election. Tonight, two candidates for the 3rd Congressional District square off in just a few minutes. Tom MacArthur arrived just a short while ago here at NJTV. He's the incumbent in this race, a Republican seeking a third term representing the South Jersey District. Andy Kim is the Democratic nominee. He arrived just a short while ago as well. Kim is a former national security director in the Obama administration, and this is his first run for public office. Tonight's moderator, NJTV News senior correspondent, David Cruz. We've called in some top strategists to help us walk through the issues. Democratic strategist Bill Pasquale III, Republican strategist Chris Russell, and director of the Monmouth University Polling Institute, pollster Patrick Murray. Thank you all for being with us. Chris, yeah. first question to you. You're with the MacArthur campaign. 
MacArthur is the only New Jersey congressman who's uh, voted with President Trump on both the health care repeal and the tax cuts. Do you expect him to walk that back a bit tonight? I don't. Uh, I don't expect to walk it back. Tom decided to not be a uh, bystander in Congress. He was someone who wanted to be consequential, wanted to be in the action. Uh, I think he'll talk about why he made those votes and also that he was ranked one of the most bipartisan members of Congress, uh, top 10 percent by the Luger Center. Bill, campaign finance, health care, taxation, big issues here. But what's the overall big issue here as you see it? Well, I think it's uh, providing uh, the electorate with a sense that you're independent. You're not going to be stridently supportive of your party even when it's wrong. That's important. I think that's what's on people's minds. And I think the two pocketbook issues on taxes, we'll know when we file our taxes next April whether the Trump tax cut was good for us in New Jersey or not, and health care. Patrick, the 3rd Congressional District stretches across the state from uh, Ocean County on the east to all the way over to Burlington County with, with a million, uh, more than a million acres of right. pine lands in the middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> and it might as well be Mars and Venus. How does a candidate, either one of them, uh, reach both constituencies? They're so different. That's the difficulty. And by the way, this is probably my favorite district as a pollster to poll. I've been polling this district for many years. I love this district this, uh, because it is so vastly different. You have these two different. You have the, the Ocean County part, portion of that district, which is the New York media market, has the largest number of Trump supporters in the state. Then you go to the Delaware Riverside, Burlington County, and the Philadelphia media market, an entirely different ballgame there. So you have to kind of Way, you know, way, what you're going to do with both of those those different districts in mind. Now, in the past, the Ocean County portion of the district, which is smaller, has actually had more sway because the, the Republican has gotten a, a much larger advantage out of there. We're seeing in our polling, though, that that's being offset by this Democratic enthusiasm in uh, in, in the Burlington County portion of that district, and that's the that's why this race is so close. Obama won this district in 2008. He won it again in 2012. Trump won it in 2016. Is that correct? Right. So this is just really, is this still a toss-up at this point in this district? Yeah, absolutely. It is a toss-up. And that's what we're finding. Districts like this across the country, there's a lot of these types of Obama-Trump districts in the Midwest, are really, uh, are really, really a toss-up uh, because those, uh, those Trump voters, a lot of those Trump voters, want change. And so they're looking for somebody who can bring change. And sometimes that also means the incumbent congressman could get tossed out. I think in this case, that's not the reason why this is close. I think it's, it's the, that, that Democratic portion. But that's what makes this race interesting. Andy Kim has, uh, is very well financed in this campaign, but has, really has to break through. Tonight is his big public chance to do that. What does he have to do, Bill? I think he's got to do what he's been doing from day one. Be genuine. Talk about his Jersey roots. Talk about his approach. He's not a partisan in any sense. Obviously, his credentials are awe-inspiring and very impressive. But I think he wants to talk about how he's going to differentiate himself from the congressman that's there now. And I think he'll do a fine job doing that because proof is in his record. He's not been a partisan politician. He's an independent thinker. He's advised both Democratic and Republican administrations adeptly. Time to get down to business now. The candidates here have qualified to be on the official ballot published by the State Division of Elections and have at least 10 percent support among registered voters as reflected by a reputable, experienced and independent poll. Here are the ground rules. The moderator will ask the questions. The editorial content of the questions has been determined by our editorial staff and has not been shared with any candidate. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer. Should the moderator allow follow-ups or rebuttals, responses will be limited to 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Each candidate will be allowed to pose one question directly to his opponent. While there will be no opening statements, candidates will be allowed 60 seconds for closing statements. And a coin toss chose the order of closing statements and podium positions. With that, we turn it over to senior correspondent David Cruz. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Mr. Kim, Mr. MacArthur, thanks for being with us tonight. I want to begin with a discussion about some of the events that have taken place in the country over the past couple of weeks. In that period, we've seen two people shot and killed in the grocery store because of their race, mail bombs sent to prominent elected officials because of their politics, 
and 11 people killed in Pittsburgh because of their religion. Many are seeing this as the, national, uh, the natural regression of the harsh and sometimes offensive rhetoric that now dominates our national discourse. Who or what do you think is responsible for this? We'll start with you, Mr. MacArthur. Well, thanks for hosting this tonight, uh, David. And, and the events of this last few weeks are, are pretty disturbing. I've been at a couple of vigils uh, with the Jewish community in both Burlington and Ocean County. It is, uh, it, it's devastating that anyone can't go into their place of worship and worship freely. I think this is a time to try to bring down uh, the angst. It certainly doesn't help. And I think when people say things and, and write things, uh, they may be okay for many people to hear, but there are people that are on the edge, and they hear those things, and it can drive them over the edge. That said, the people that commit the acts are the ones responsible for the acts. And I think we go too far sometimes in trying to point fingers and politicize immediately after these events, and I don't think it's helpful. Mr. Kim, we'll ask you the same question. Well, thank you, David, for having us on this program. And I think this is incredibly important for the voters here in New Jersey. I think the last few days have been very devastating and tough for this country. And it calls upon us to have a civil discussion here talking to the voters. And that's what this is about. I think about how I was talking on the phone with a friend of mine in Pittsburgh, and she was telling me how her extended family was affected by the shooting. And I could hear the pain in her voice. And I started crying as well. And I didn't realize that my three-year-old baby boy is right next to me. And I, he never seen me cry before and asked me what went wrong. And trying to explain to him what happened, it was so difficult. And it calls upon all of us to make sure that we have the kind of discourse, we have the kind of focus to have the unity that we need right now in this country to be able to move forward, put aside our differences, and recognize in the wake of this tragedy what we can do together. And that's what I hope we have going forward. All right, thank you both. Mr. Kim, the president suggested that the mass shooting in Pittsburgh could have been avoided if there was an armed guard in the synagogue. Do you agree with that? Well, what I'll say is that the situation there is complex, and we don't know what would have changed if there were different scenarios there. But an armed guard at every single synagogue or church is not the answer to these problems. The answers are for our leaders to come together, to be able to find sensible ways forward, to be able to do what the American people want. We have well over 90 percent of Americans that are in support of universal background checks for gun safety. Those are the types of actions that our leaders need to make sure we move forward on. And I'm worried about some of the steps that my opponent has supported. He was the only member of Congress from New Jersey to vote yes and co-sponsor, <clears throat> well, to co-sponsor the concealed carry reciprocity legislation. Those are the types of legislations that would make us less safe, and we need to make sure we come together to be able to support the communities. Mr. MacArthur, you can take 30 seconds to rebut. Well, I do get concerned when every time there's a tragedy, immediately people go to whatever their particular political agenda is. I've tried, I made comments just the other night, remarks at one of the vigils, and I avoided doing that. But I do understand there's a, there's a legitimate discussion at the right time about gun safety issues. I have supported uh, universal background checks. I voted for the fixed next bill to fix the, the uh, federal system. I voted for the school... Uh, Stop a Violence Act and announced just a few weeks ago the first grant in BRIC for nearly a half a million dollars. I'm very far, and I just introduced two bills in the last week uh, to try to get at these safety issues. All right, uh, Mr. McCarthy, we'll stay with you. Uh, a flyer supporting your candidacy featured a font style that mimicked the Chinese food restaurant menu, and it was condemned by many as racist. Another ad supporting you had the tagline, Andy Kim is, quote, not one of us. Do you condemn these ads? Well, first of all, it wasn't my ad. It was, it was an outside group, and they clearly stated in the ad that uh, Andy Kim is a Nancy Pelosi liberal and not one of us. So uh, it's, I didn't say it, and I think it's people just race baiting is, is what it really is. Uh, two of my th three children are uh, a Korean descent. My only uh, granddaughter is, is my Korean-American granddaughter, uh, who was born a year and a half ago. The idea that I'm racist is simply absurd, and it's, and it's my opponent should be standing and saying, uh, let's not have race baiting. Instead, I think he's piled on and tried to get sympathy from people for it. It's a ridiculous argument. There's not a racist bone in my body, 
and he knows it. So, so why, why continue to foment that? All right. Mr. Kim, you want to take 30 seconds to rebut? Well, this is just continued distractions from the main issues of this campaign, where we need to be focused on what the voters care about, health care and taxes, and these other issues that are at the front of this all. <clears throat> my concerns are, and the voters' concerns are about my opponent's record on health care how he got a pre-existing condition protections. Those true. are the types of actions and those are the types of issues that we should be focused on, not on these distractions that are taking us away from the main issues of November 6. You look like you want to say well, something. Well, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll talk more about health care, but you continue to say things like that that you know are dishonest. That idea, things like pre-existing conditions, you know that our bill specifically protected people's pre-existing conditions. You talk about an age tax, you know that that's been debunked right, by that, PolitiFact and others, but we're you gonna keep, get, We're going to get saying, to a, a deeper discussion about that. I'm, so, I'm sure yeah. we will, but you can't just keep saying dishonest things because it plays well. All right, let's talk about that when we get to that issue. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to immigration now. Uh, a caravan of several thousand migrants is approaching the U.S.-Mexico border. The president has said that there are, quote, bad people and suggested, quote, Middle Eastern people had infiltrated the caravan. He's threatened to close the border and send up to 15,000 active duty military personnel to the area. Is this an appropriate response? We'll start with uh, you, Mr. Kim. I've been in, I worked in the situation many times when the discussion about troop deployments was, were being made. And what I'll say is that is the most solemn and important role of the commander in chief to think about what is going to be a responsible use of our military force not only in terms of where they're going to be going, but also in terms of our military preparedness and the ability to be able to respond elsewhere. So when I look at what's happening, I haven't seen the kind of details and response by uh, military leaders on why it's necessary to have that level of troop deployments there. We want to make sure we're protecting our border. We want to make sure we can protect our communities and support the government of Mexico as uh, they're processing many of the, the migrants as well. Uh, but we want to do so in a way that is responsible. And we can't have an ounce of politics involved when it comes to our troop deployments, putting our armed service men and women in different locations and situations. So I hope that's the way that we proceed. Mr. MacArthur, an appropriate response? 60 seconds. Well, your, your campaign has received a lot of contributions from people that want to abolish ICE, that don't respect the law enforcement officers that are at the border trying to protect our country. I don't see... Uh, where we can't be a compassionate nation and also be a nation that, that has the rule of law. And we cannot have people just wandering into the country. We can't. Uh, whether there are people taking advantage of that caravan and slipping in, uh, who knows? But is it possible? Of course it's possible. Most of the uh, illegal drugs coming into this country, most of the illegal heroin is coming across the southern border. We have to protect the border. I think General Mattis said it really well earlier today. He's sending troops in a support role, not a, not a combat role, not a military role. That's the job of ICE. But they need help to, to put a physical barrier so that people can't walk in and then get released and, and, uh, and, and create a problem for the nation. We have to have a secure border. And that's compassionate to our country, to our people. All right, Mr. MacArthur, the president says he wants to limit the number of legal immigrants. Important segments of the district's economy, including agriculture and tourism, rely heavily on immigrant labor. What do you think the impact of this policy could be on the local economy? Well, it's a real issue. We voted on two immigration bills before recess, and I uh, voted no on the one that cut immigration numbers uh, significantly for that very reason. Uh, we are at a low unemployment rate, a 50-year low unemployment rate, we can't continue to grow our economy if we don't have people coming in. But they have to come in legally. We have a million people coming in legally. We have uh, years of backlog for people that want to uh, stay in the country, want to become citizens. We can't let other people jump the line. Uh, even as we uh, give visas for people to come in seasonally, we, we can do that. But we can't just have people coming in and, uh, and taking advantage of our, of our immigration laws. That's not good for the country either. We have to balance both. Mr. Kim, you want to take 30 seconds to respond to that? Well, I agree. We'll want to focus on the legal pathways and make sure that we're going through that in the same way that my parents came to this country. I'm the son of immigrants, and this is something deeply important to me personally. <clears throat> so I hope we can make sure that we do that in a bipartisan way. 
be able to make sure that we take the steps that are needed to be able to address these issues. So I agree on many of those points. All right. On um, health care, we asked viewers to send us some questions that were important to them. Uh, the first of those concerns, health care. And for that, we turn to our partners at NJ Spotlight and John Mooney. John. Hi, David. Uh, as we've done in the previous debates, we're here in the newsroom monitoring and joining in conversations online, be they Reddit, Facebook, uh, Twitter, of course. Um, and over the course of the last month, we've heard from hundreds and hundreds of readers and viewers and, and talking about what they want to ask the candidates and then being able to pose some of those questions. The latest one comes from Lauren Izzo, uh, Rizzo, I'm sorry, a 33-year-old IT consultant who, like so many of our readers, cares about health care costs. And much of her family actually are Canadians. I spoke with her today, and she, while, uh, obviously living under a single-payer system, while she's not necessarily advocating that, she says something must be done. And her question to the, con to the candidates is, what should, could, can, can we do about the rising cost of health care and health insurance? Thanks, John. That's one of the biggest issues you gentlemen know uh, in the district. Mr. MacArthur, you were a key player in the efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, let's start with you. How do we get costs down for, for seniors and working people particularly? Well, that has been my cost. And everything I've done is to bring costs down, to give states more flexibility, uh, to do things like fee-for-service reform so doctors aren't paid just for activity, to do tort reform so that doctors aren't practicing defensive medicine, to bring prescription drug costs down by stopping other countries from freeloading off of our innovations, or putting a cap on what insurance companies can, uh, can charge in deductibles and copays, to bring more transparency. I, vo I voted uh, just before we left Washington on a bill that allows pharmacists to tell a, a person if it's cheaper for them just to buy the drug instead of going through insurance. These are solutions that can actually work. My opponent, and he might try to walk it back as he's done quite a few times, is on record in recording saying that he supports a single payer system that the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg have all said you would have to double the taxes of every person, every senior every business, and you still couldn't pay for that single-payer system, and yet that's what you've articulated, that's, that's what you've advanced as an idea. It would be a disaster for our country. I have, it in, I have it in a recording. You said it in Barnegat earlier this year, and you've tried to walk it back. This is my problem. You don't, you change your positions, and you're not honest, Andy. All right, let me give him 30 seconds okay. to respond, and you guys can go at it. Go ahead, Mr. Kim. Well, what I worry about on these issues are people telling me in this district that they pay $1,000 out of pocket every month for prescription drugs or that they file for bankruptcy because of the health care costs of their son. Those are the problems that people are facing. This is personal. This is not about politics. I care about this, and I want to make sure everybody in this country has the health care that they need and deserve. And my opponent tries to take those words and twist them out of context. But you can't fix that with gauzy generalities. You need specific things that actually bring costs down. And, and you, you said to somebody asking you about a specific House bill, Medicare for All, that 125 Democrats have supported in the House, and you said you supported that. No, I did not. I said I shared the goal of having everybody in this country have health care. That's what I said. And you continue to twist my words, Congressman. What is he saying that you said that you say you didn't say? <laughs> so what he said, someone asked me about a, a bill in Congress right. about Medicare for all. And I said that I support the vision and goal of having everyone in this country have health care. But I then specifically said I did not support that legislation. And I thought that there were flaws with it. And those were the exact words, those were the exact words that I was using. And my opponent continuously uses this and twists it out of per control. Perha perhaps if you didn't speak in gauzy generalities all the time, uh, and actually gave specific proposals for solving things, you wanted that audience to think that you were with them. It was obvious. You said you supported the goals, you've, and you, uh, you've obviously listened to it recently again. Andy, the words, it's on my website. People can listen to it for themselves and hear your own words out of your own mouth. And I hope you, the whole context of that answer is on your website then. But not just some slice of it that you continuously do over the course of this campaign, taking things out of context. Is it an edited portion? I'll make sure it's all there. All right. Let's move on then. Um, this question is for both of you. The president recently signed legislation aimed at curbing the opioid crisis, yet New Jersey 
is on pace to exceed 3,000 drug deaths in 2018. That would be a new record for the third consecutive year. Are we doing enough to combat this crisis? We'll start with you, Mr. Kim. Absolutely not doing enough on this crisis. We have over 70,000 Americans dying every year of drug overdose. This is a national security crisis. This is something we should approach with that same level of urgency that we do when it comes to terrorism, war, and conflict. Uh, we need to make sure we have an approach and a response that is, that is commensurate with the problem. Our funding right now for the opioid crisis is a fraction of where it needs to be, and I hope that both parties can come together and be able to increase what we're doing. But we also have to recognize the threats that have come into play on the tools that we have right now. My opponent supported that health care repeal bill that would have gutted and cut $880 billion out of Medicaid. Medicaid is the number one tool we have right now to be able to address the opioid crisis. Nearly 40 percent of Americans who are getting treatment uh, for a drug addiction are getting it through Medicaid. That would have been devastating to our response to the opioid crisis. Mr. MacArthur, you're the co-chair of the Bipartisan Heroin Task Force. Uh, same question to you. Does this bill do enough? It's never enough because we're losing uh, people all around us every day. Uh, I was asked to chair this task force, and it brought me into a world that uh, is difficult to be, to be in because you see the devastation. But I will say this about the bill. One, uh, it was about 50 different bills that we passed. 30 of them were written by members of the task force that I chair along with a Democrat. Equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. Every single bill was bipartisan. Every single bill. That's our requirement, that they be bipartisan. We funded nearly $7 billion, billion with a B, to help communities fight back. Is it enough? It, it'll never be enough until we stop losing people, but it's by far the most that the government has ever uh, addressed a drug crisis with. And it's a good start, and we're doing it together, without partisan rancor, leaving things where we don't see eye to eye on the side, and focusing on what we can do together. And that's the way this has to, that, that's how this has to go if we're going to have any success with it. You talk about money. Is money enough? Well, it, money is critical. You have to get people into treatment. It takes time. It, sending somebody in for 28 days is not enough time. But we did other policy changes, like lifting the, uh, the exclusion in Medicaid that only allowed people to go to facilities with 16 beds or less. We changed that so they can go to any facility for help. We, we're doing a lot of things to try to help people. And one of those things has to be stopping the flow of drugs across the southern border. That's a big part of our border security issue. Where does the bill fall, fall short in your mind, Mr. Kim? Take 30 seconds. Well, the funding on the opioid crisis falls well short. As the congressman said, about $7 billion that are being spent. With domestic spending on HIV AIDS, that's in the $30 billion range, we can be doing a lot more to be able to do this. But it comes down to choices. We have the choice and the ability to be able to support what we needed to do with the opioid crisis. But instead, that focus moved away, and it was something that was my opponent and the Republican leadership put towards giving tax cuts to wealthiest Americans and the biggest corporations instead. That was a choice that he made. I would have made a different choice. You want to take 30 seconds on that? I, you're comparing two different things that... Uh, it just seems like a cheap shot. What, we'll talk about tax cuts, I'm sure. But, and I'm not sure when you talk about $30 billion for HIV AIDS, you're talking about the same time period. $7 billion in a year is a massive amount of federal support for this crisis. It, it, we need to do everything we need to do. This is a human tragedy. I've said before, and I believe it still, this is the number one domestic issue facing our country. And it takes members of Congress working together, not pointing fingers, not acting like the other party caused the problem, working together. And that's what I've done and my Democratic co-chair have done on the heroin task force. All right. One of you mentioned taxes. We'll go there. Uh, some estimates predict that the Republican uh, tax plan will mean a savings of about $1,600 to the average residents of the district. The plan doubles the standard deduction, doubles the child care credit, and, and the $10,000 deduction for state and local taxes is larger than the average property bill in both Ocean and Burlington counties. Why wouldn't a voter in the 3rd District think that that's a pretty good deal, Mr. Kim? 
Great question. Well, over 40 percent, about 43 percent of people in the New Jersey 3rd Congressional District take the state and local tax deduction. And when you factor in, you, your statistic was just referencing property taxes. But with property taxes and income taxes, it's over the $10,000 cap in both counties. These are the problems that people are facing. And it comes down to the people that I've met and talked to. A gentleman named Bob, a 90-year-old in Morristown, New Jersey, mm -hmm. who told me that he's on a fixed income. And he's worried about how he's going to be able to be able to pay his dues when he's not able to deduct his state and local tax deductions anymore. It comes down to people here. It's about their personal stories. And what we saw here was a direct choice to be able to give the biggest corporations and the wealthiest Americans major tax cuts and not leaving and not giving the individual tax cuts, uh, making those permanent and then gutting uh, and capping the state and local tax deductions. New Jersey pays enough. We only get 76 cents back for every dollar we put into the federal government. We should be uh, making sure we stand up for that in Washington. Uh, Mr. MacArthur, uh, on the other hand, this tax cut is costing something like uh, a trillion dollars or close to a trillion dollars. Can the country afford that? Well, uh, I'll answer that. But you said really well all the reasons why it was good to vote for the tax bill. The $1,600 is for a single person. The average family of four in this congressional district is saving over $3,500 a year, $35,000 over a 10-year period. And everyone knows where I stand. I voted on it, and I, and I was one of the key negotiators that took the, the state and local tax deduction from zero to $10,000. I think it's a fair question. Will you vote to repeal it? Because you say it's a disaster. You've called it a sham. You're going to have an opportunity to ask him a direct question okay. later. In the meantime, I'll, but, I'll but do I, the questions, but, but go ahead. But I think, it's a, I think it's a fair question. If it's so terrible, are you saying you're going to repeal it and raise everyone's taxes in this district? As far as the cost goes, if we grow the economy at about a half a percent more per year than we were growing it over the last 10 years, and we sustain that, it will pay for itself. All growth beyond that will help us bring down our national debt. This is our best shot. It's not a slam dunk, David, but it's our best shot at bringing down our deficit by growing the economy. It's good for, it's good for families. It's good for businesses. It's good for employers and employees. And our economy is booming because of it. Uh, I don't see, I just don't understand why my opponent thinks the sky is falling when, when things are going so well. Mr. Kim. My opponent was saying that everyone knows where he stands on this issue. I agree. We know where he stands on this. He stands with his party leadership that he votes 94 percent in line with. He stands with them on tapping state and local tax deductions when he campaigned in 2014 to, go to protect our property taxes. I stand with the delegation of New Jersey, the other 11 members of Congress from New Jersey, including the other four Republican members of Congress that voted against this tax law because they knew that it was a bad deal for New Jersey. I stand with New Jersey on this. Can, can I just respond to that? You've said this before. I guess your idea of leadership is if people are going this way, you're just going to follow the herd, because that's obviously the way to go. Look, I, I, I don't relish being alone on any vote, but I didn't go to Congress for other people to tell me how to vote. I vote my conscience. I spent my life in business. And when I look at these tax cuts, I see something that is going to grow our economy. And that's why I've supported it. You say I follow party leadership, Andy. Uh, I've been named one of the most bipartisan members of Congress by an independent group, the Luger Center. The Burlington County Times, when they endorsed me, cited my bipartisanship. I've been endorsed by groups that normally endorse Democrats. They didn't endorse you. The police, the fire union, the building trades, they all chose to endorse me instead of you because I actually am bipartisan. So I don't know where you can come off saying that I'm just following a party line. I've, I've uh, gone against the party when I need to, and I stand up for the things that I think are right, and I'm not there just to follow the herd, which I guess is what you think the job of a congressman is. It's not. You want to take a minute, uh, 30 seconds to respond to that? The job of a congressman is to represent the people of their district. And my yes. opponent failed to do that when he voted on this tax law without doing a single town hall, which he still hasn't done in almost 550 days, not giving us an opportunity to be able to tell him what we think. And that's why NJEA and a number of other organizations that endorsed him have now endorsed me. And the Philadelphia Inquirer, who endorsed me just the other week, endorsed him twice before and said he lost his way. And that's why they're endorsing me now. They also said you've been deceptive. Have Maybe you we'll lost your way? 
I haven't lost my way. Look, I went to Congress as a businessman. I told people that I was going to work with everyone, Democrats, Republicans, to get things done. We have enough dysfunction in this government. We don't need professional protesters, which is what you've been for the last three years. We don't need protesters in Washington just stirring the pot. That doesn't accomplish a thing. So, no, I haven't lost my way. I'm, I'm doing what I said I would do. I'm working with people across the aisle. I work with the president when I can. And when I disagree with him, I say so. Bipartisan enough for you, Mr. Kim? No, he's not. He's not bipartisan enough. He cites the Luger Center, which goes into uh, co-sponsorships of different bills. But what the people of this district care about is his voting record. And he votes 94 percent in line with the party leadership, the highest in the entire state of New Jersey. And that's the, that's the focus of the people of the Jersey Third when they think about, is he bipartisan? The answer is no. All right. We asked you both to prepare a question uh, for your opponent, the order of which has been determined by a coin toss. Mr. Kim, let's start with you. Congressman. Congressman, the voters of the New Jersey 3rd Congressional District, when I talk to them, they worry deeply about and they're tired of politicians and uh, who are earning millions of dollars while in Washington supposed to be representing the, rep uh, the people of the, their district. You were invested nearly a million dollars in the lead up in health care companies in the lead up to your uh, efforts on the health care repeal bill. I want to ask you if you will commit to divesting from companies and corporations that have business in front of Congress, business in front of the work that you were doing in Congress. Andy, the premise of your question is, first of all, is ridiculous. And anyone can Google and see that I'm, I'm uh, not needing to play the kind of games that you're suggesting. Uh, when I got on the Armed Services Committee, I divested myself of all defense stocks. When I got on the Natural Resource Committee, I uh, divested myself of all stocks that had anything to do with that committee. Didn't have to do it either time. When I got on the Financial Services Committee, I divested myself of all bank and financial service stocks. I didn't have to do that either. I did it because I didn't want anyone to conclude that, that my eye was off the ball. You're asking me basically to divest from the economy because every segment of the economy has business before Congress. So, no, I think it's, it's a ridiculous suggestion. And I think it, it comes out of you looking suspiciously at business, at success. You've spent your whole life working in the government. I'm not faulting you for that, but you haven't spent a day in the private sector where most Americans work and most of these, con these, these constituents work in the private sector. You act like business is, is some evil thing. It's not, Andy. It, it, it's a great force for good in our economy, just like government can be. All right, Mr. MacArthur, uh, your question to Mr. Kim. All right, you and I, Andy, did a live discussion with the Asbury Park Press a couple of weeks ago. And I asked you about uh, this age tax and pre-existing conditions. And I asked you, and, and I'll paraphrase your answer. You tell me if I got it wrong, and then I'll ask my question. You said that, no, these things did not apply to anyone, uh, any senior on Medicare. And no, they did not apply to anyone who got their insurance from their job. That's correct? Uh, in part, that's correct. OK. And by the way, they don't, also don't apl uh, apply to anyone who gets their insurance from the VA or from military TRICARE. So you acknowledged that all this noise about age tax and pre-existing conditions was a all from the Affordable, the, the American Health Care Act was all for a small group of people in Obamacare. My question for you is, why then, since it has never applied to seniors, why then have you flooded with millions of dollars of advertising? You have flooded senior citizens with scare tactic mailers and advertising, telling them that they're getting an age tax, telling them that they're going to lose coverage for pre-existing conditions. They're on Medicare, Andy. You are, you are fear-mongering Let me get you seniors. to a question, though, I, Mr. I'd MacArthur. like to know why. How could you do that when you know? How could you specifically target senior citizens when you know none of this stuff ever applied to them, ever? Well, I'm really glad you raised this issue, Congressman, because the age tax, that's something that AARP called it an age tax. They read your amendment. You misquoted they, them. They read, no, I did not misquote them. Let them answer. They okay. read your amendment and said, 
This is an age tax because Americans over the age of 50 who are, and, and those not on Medicare could be subject to be charged five times more than younger Americans. That was what the AARP said. That has 38 million members. I trust them. I trust their words and I trust their analysis, an independent organization. So that's what they said, and, we, and, and many other medical organizations, the American Medical Association, uh, panned the MacArthur Amendment for what it did in making, uh, potentially making uh, health care unaffordable for those with pre-existing conditions. Your bill opened up those floodgates, opened up that type of attack. So I'm glad you raised this question, so because that, it's something that is important for the people. So you didn't answer the question, though. Let, that let, bill. Him, let him answer. Let him answer. You're targeting senior citizens when you know, first of all, that never became law, and secondly, it never touched senior citizens or people over 50 that got their, ins their, their insurance from their job. Never covered them, never touched them at all, and yet those are the very people you're targeting. Why? Why do you target them with your advertising? Well, I'm glad your bill never made it into law, and that's been able to prevent a lot of the problems that we have. But we've been very clear that this is something that was targeting, um, that would have targeted Americans over the age of 50, so they could be charged up to five times more. And if they are you're in that situation answering. where they I, lose their employer health care, if they're not able to get on Medicare because they're not of age yet, those are problems that they need to know about. And that's why the AARP, a trusted source for issues related to uh, Americans, seniors in this country, said it was an age tax. All right, we're going to move on, uh, gentlemen. Uh, according to the sentencing project, New Jersey has the highest disparity in the nation of incarceration rates between whites and blacks. Blacks are incarcerated at a rate 12 times that of whites. How would you address this issue? We'll start with you, Mr. Kim. This is a really big problem and one that's not just here in New Jersey, but we see it all over the country. And I hope that we're able to take the steps to be able to address this. I think steps about how we're able to deal with um, uh, bail bonds, how we're also able to deal with drug of uh, nonviolent drug offenses. Those are the types of actions that I hope we are able to move forward on and make sure that our judicial system is one that's going to be equal, one that's going to be able to deal with those that have uh, the greatest uh, offenses, especially violent crimes, and be able to treat those fairly, those that did not have those violent crimes, but make sure that we're doing this all in a way focused on keeping our communities safe. Mr. McCarthy, you want to take 30 seconds to answer that? Sure. I, I don't know the cause in New Jersey. I do know this, though. Justice needs to be colorblind. And I think it, it is always important to ask if there are disparities among different groups, why? Uh, one issue that's come up a lot is uh, the use of marijuana. A lot of people are in, in uh, jail over that. And I have supported looking at different criminal penalties for that, not legalizing it, but looking at different criminal penalties. And, and that perhaps might help. I've, I've heard others argue that that would help a lot. You mentioned marijuana. I'll ask a yes or no from uh, either of you. Would you support the legalization of adult use marijuana? Not for recreational use. I've, I've seen on our heroin task that's, force. That's not it's a, a gateway. Word. Sorry. <laughs> but it's, not, it's a gateway drug for some, David. I support for medical purposes at this point. But not for adult recreational that's use. That's correct. All right. Uh, we're going to move on now. You've accused each other of being beholden to special interest groups. Can you name those groups uh, and, and why your, asso your opponent's association with them is bad for the district? We'll start with uh, you, Mr. MacArthur. Naming his groups? Naming the... I'll, I'll read the question again. All right. Uh, you've accused each other of being beholden to special interest groups. Can you name them and why your opponent's association with them is bad for the district? Well, my opponent has made a big deal about not taking corporate... Uh, PAC money, big, big deal. And yet he takes money from people who take corporate PAC money. Like Bob Menendez, he stood with him, said he was a great man. He campaigned with him. He's taken money from him. He's taken money from a lot of others who want to shut down ICE, sh shut down, uh, uh, ha have open borders. He's taken money and campaigned with Elizabeth Warren, who voted against the joint base not once but three times, the joint base in this district, largest employer in the district. And, and probably the biggest special interest group is the one he's been trying to hide from, his own. Andy Kim founded an organization called RISE immediately after President Trump was elected president. He has been a, a professional protester 
since this president was elected and has done all sorts of very active, I hope we'll come back to this, but active things to protest the president, organizing conventions, uh, marches with people that call for jihad against the president, and he's tried to hide from that and deceive voters about it uh, for, for this entire campaign. Mr. Kim, what are the groups that, uh, the special interest groups that he's associated with, and why is that association bad for the district? I've promised, as my opponent said, I promised not to take corporate PAC money. That was something very important from the outset of this campaign, is showing that I'm going to be focused on the people of this district, because that's a contrast to my opponent. <clears throat> my, con my opponent takes enormous sums of money from corporate PACs. He received over $500,000 of contributions from pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, and wrote their health care repeal bill. Those are the types of actions that I was trying to get to, again, with the question that I asked him about who is he working for? Who is he trying to represent in Congress? Because he's not holding town halls. He's not talking to the people of this district and giving us the kind of voice that we need in Washington. And that's why I continue to point out what he did on health care, that he was the only member of Congress from New Jersey to vote yes on that tax bill. Those are the problems that I see with the way that he's operated in Congress. Now, I'm going to give both of you another 30 seconds to uh, respond to that. Let's start with well, you. You just accused me of being in the bag with pharmaceuticals. That is ludicrous. You have campaigned with Cory Booker and Bob Menendez, who have both taken millions of dollars from pharmaceutical companies. And Andy, you are at the end right now of a $900,000 ad buy with the DCCC. That name will resonate with voters because they've been seeing those ads blanketed. And you authorized them. Your name is at the end. I'm Andy Kim, and I approve this ad. They are flush with corporate dollars. And you've done a coordinated ad buy with them. And, and meanwhile, you try to look like you're holier than thou, like I don't touch PAC money. Where are you getting all your money from, Andy? You've raised enormous sums outside of Jersey, and all of the supporters running these ads on TV are running them with corporate dollars, and you want to pretend like you're innocent of it. it it's the, hip that, it's that's the hypocrisy. Your time. That's your time, Mr. MacArthur. Mr. Kim, go ahead. I'm proud of the campaign that we run. I'm proud that we've run a campaign that's about the people. We've had hundreds of small dollar uh, town hall, uh, t small dollar uh, house parties and other events throughout the district. And you can see by the size of our volunteer base just how energized people are. That's been the focus, not taking the corporate PAC money, but instead doing a campaign with integrity. That's how we've been able to build this out. And there are a lot of people in this district, a lot of people around that are upset at what my opponent has done on health care. And that's why we've been able to raise the money that we needed to be able to run this campaign against someone who just spent, uh, just loaned himself $1.4 million to be able to come and attack me in this final stretch. All right, but you didn't answer the question. $900,000 you just spent with the DCCC. You didn't respond to it. All right, let's turn to a discussion of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, so-called entitlement programs. Our business correspondent, Rhonda Schaffler, has this report. Social Security, which provides guaranteed income and retirement, has been in place since the 1930s. Medicare and Medicaid, which provide health care to senior citizens and the poor, have been in place since the 1960s. And while millions currently receive these benefits, some of the programs are running out of money. Each year, the Social Security Board of Trustees releases a report on the long-term financial health of America's entitlement programs. Medicare is ailing. The program is expected to deplete its funds in just eight years. It's running out of money faster than earlier projections due to an aging population and increased costs. In terms of Social Security, the fund that pays retirees is due to be depleted in 16 years. At that time, Social Security will only be able to pay out 77 percent of the benefits it owes to recipients. The fund that helps disabled people is expected to remain solvent for another 14 years. Meantime, Medicaid enrollment decreased this year, according to a separate report, but spending on that program continues to increase. That is a big issue in the district, as you both know. Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. MacArthur. Are you, you have any proposals to ensure the solvency of these programs? Well, first, I see... Uh, Social Security, Social Security and Medicare as a, as a sacred pact from one generation to the next. Today's generation of workers pays in, today's generation of retirees takes out. The biggest problem, the biggest uh, threat to Social Security was millions of people sitting on the sidelines. 
And because of the tax cuts bill uh, and the things that we're doing to help the economy, we have the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years right now. Wages are up. Money is going into Social Security like it hasn't in, uh, in quite a while, and that is the best thing we can do to save that program. The things I suggested earlier with health care will help Medicare. Fee-for-service reform, tort reform, bringing down the cost of drugs with specific steps with uh, uh, other countries, freeloading, limiting deductibles from insurance, all the things that bring the cost of health care down will uh, take, take pressure off of Medicare. The answer is not the Medicare for all that my opponent has uh, adopted. That will bankrupt Medicare as we know it. All right, Mr. Kim, take 60 seconds if you like. These issues are, are really personal to me and my family right now. Uh, my mother just retired this year, and what I thought was going to be a joyous occasion for her ended up being one of filled with anxiety as she doesn't have, that she's dependent on Social Security for a large part of her income. And she's got multiple different pre-existing conditions, and she worries about her health care under Medicare. So these are very personal. And I've gone around and talked to so many people across this district that are worried about these. So we're trying to find solutions, because my mother came to me and she said, you know, why do we hear from Republican Party leadership, Senator Mitch McConnell, most recently, when they're saying and, and telling, talking about these entitlements, as they call them, instead of the earned benefits that they are, and saying that those are the core so sources of the problems that we face with our debt, rather than the tax law that they just uh, put into place that ballooned our deficit. Taking steps like allowing Medicare to be able to negotiate drug prices, making sure we can pursue these bundled payments um, projects that, that seem to be helping get costs under control and expanding that. Those are some proposals that we can do to, to lower the costs of people on Medicare and protect Social Security as well. Your opponent says a rising economy would, would solve the problem. A rising economy certainly would be helpful, and it's certainly something that's going to make sure that we are continuing to pay into that. But when we see with this tax law, this tax law just took three years off the Medicare trust fund because of the lack of the lower amount of revenue coming into the government. These are the types of actions that we need to buffer against, make sure we get things on a better path. And I agree with my opponent that these are promises that we have to make to the American people. And that's why I want to take these steps to always say we will stand up for their Social Security, their Medicare, and their Medicaid as well. You want to take 30 seconds? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I heard a proposal on all of that, but I didn't just say a rising economy. I said we can also take specific steps to bring the cost of health care down, and I, I think those are real answers. I've only heard you offer, let's have uh, a Medicare negotiate drug prices. I'm not sure having a few bureaucrats at one agency setting prices is really the best answer. I think if insurers have limited deductibles and co-pays, they'll do a better job of negotiating. And, I, and to me, that's a better solution. Look, I'll work with anyone, both sides of the aisle, on solutions to these issues. It's you critical. Wanna, you want to take 30 seconds? Absolutely. The prescription drug costs are a huge problem for seniors in this country. As I mentioned, a gentleman <laughs> I met pays $1,000 out of pocket every month. Being able to allow Medicare to be able to negotiate these drug prices, that's something that can help draw these, these costs down, the same way that the VA does, that the Department of Defense does for their insurance. This is a proposal that President Trump supported when he was a candidate. And in fact, just the other day, President Trump put a, a proposal with different uh, proposals about how to get prescription drug costs under Medicare lower. Some of those ideas, I think, are ones that we should pursue in a bipartisan way, in addition to allowing Medicare Part D to be able to negotiate. All right, we have another online viewer question. Let's go to our NJ Spotlight partners and John Mooney. John. Hi, David. Uh, I spoke with another, another reader uh, today. His name is John Brodowski of Bordentown. He works for an industrial supply company and, and is a voter in this district. And an issue he's really cared about is the student loan debt that is facing uh, many of his friends and family. And, and he, he talks about how it limits the, their hopes and dreams before they even you know, get started. And he's heard sound bites on this in the campaign, but he, he certainly would like to hear more. Specifically, his question, should Congress work to alleviate the crushing student debt issue plaguing college graduates? All right, John, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kim, 1.4 trillion outstanding dollars in uh, student loan debt, the second largest form of personal debt behind mortgages. Yeah. This is a huge crisis. 
and could be the workings of uh, our, the next financial crisis of our country if we're not uh, taking the steps to be able to alleviate this. But that aside, this comes down to very personal issues. I remember talking to a young couple just a couple days ago who were telling me that they made decisions about when to get married, when to get a house, when to get a car based off of their student debt. And we see so many young Americans that are coming out from school with their hands tied uh, because they are carrying tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt. These are experiences that my wife and I had as well coming out from school into the professional world. So we certainly need to make sure we understand that, that we allow students to immediately refinance their student loans, make sure that we have Pell Grants, especially for low-income students, as Pell Grants don't cover <clears throat> nearly as much as they used to, and also making sure that we can push back against for-profit institutions that have been uh, causing a lot of problems in terms of our higher education system. Those are some immediate steps that we hope to be able to take to address these issues. Mr. MacArthur, he's not the first person to say that this uh, could be the next uh, financial crisis in the country. It, it, it can be. It could be. Uh, look, here's the problem. Students are, are graduating with high debt into a market that really doesn't need the skills that they just got that debt for, they, they incurred the debt for. I think the federal government should not be profiting on student loans. There's no reason for 8 and 9 percent interest rates on student loans. I think that's part of the problem. And the fact that students can't re refinance them, I think, is another part of the problem. Both of those can be fixed. These whole new models of education in Burlington County, for example, what used to be Burlington County College is now Rowan College at Burlington County, and students are able to uh, enter a four-year program, the first two years of community college, and then they automatically matriculate into the four-year school for a total cost of less than $40,000, total cost. Most universities today, you pay that for one year. And that's, that's the kind of creativity that I think we need to support from the federal government. You want to take 30 seconds? I, I agree. I think those are some really innovative steps that uh, universities and businesses have been doing. I think these pipelines between some of our local education institutions <clears throat> into jobs, especially small businesses, these are the types of actions that we should be supporting, making sure that we have them help as many young Americans be able to Per, uh, transition into professional careers as soon as possible. I think those are steps in addition to making sure we're also focused on apprenticeships and trade schools, making sure that there's no one size fits all, that we're making sure that education across the board is being pushed forward and supportive. All right, let me move on. Mr. MacArthur, you believe abortion should be illegal. Is there any circumstance under which you believe a woman should have the right to choose to terminate her pregnancy? Well, let, let's, I'm not sure I would agree with the starting point of your question. Okay. I'm, I'm pro-life, and I've lived that out. My wife and I, who's here, we lived that out with our oldest daughter, who was born with, with severely handicapping issues. But for me, pro-life is that. It's, it's us adopting two children. Pro-life is a lot of things. And I know from firsthand experience how difficult circumstances can be. So I am, I am not pointing fingers at people, telling them, you, sh you shall do this, you shall not do that. Uh, that, that is not an issue that I've uh, sounded, uh, that I've sounded in, in uh, Congress at all. And yes, there are many, many uh, exceptions where I think uh, that's not an issue. What I, what I have really focused on is not having federal funding for abortion. And, and I don't think you should have abortions that are late term. Uh, I think most Americans agree with that, but, but, uh, but the basic issue has been resolved by the court many decades ago, and I have not uh, been somebody trying to push back at that. All right. Mr. Kim, you support legal abortion. Is there any circumstance under which you believe government should have the authority to curtail those rights? This is a very personal issue as well as many of these issues tonight that we discuss are. I am so sorry for the tragedy that my opponent has had to go through in your life. I, I had a health crisis not nearly as, as severe or, or, uh, or, or uh, as difficult as my opponent's. Um, but last year, my wife and I went to the hospital, and we were told that our baby-to-be that we were expecting did have some health problems. And going through that experience, however, however small our crisis was compared to what my opponent's faced and other Americans have faced, it was such a uh, 
uh, such a terrifying experience. And one that I'll tell you, uh, going through that, that is a decision for families to be making, not government in the room telling us what can or cannot be done. Um, it's something for families seeking the support and advice of medical professionals. That's where the decision should lie. All right, we'll move on. The ocean is one of the region's greatest assets and increasingly one of its biggest threats. We hear some of that in this report from senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan. Streets and homes along the Jersey Shore will flood 26 times a year or more just from rising tides, a recent study forecast. 79,000 people live in these areas that are at risk of chronic inundation over the next 30 years. We're getting more tide here than we've ever had before. When I was growing up here, we never had tide. The Union of Concerned Scientists compiled a map showing towns vulnerable to chronic inundation, some 60,000 homes. That means a combined $390 million in local property taxes wiped off the books. $27 billion of real estate that could go underwater for real. Devastation for towns and families simply from rising oceans. Look at the, the plight of the people who own property there. If they can't live there and want to sell, nobody's going to buy. I'm sure it is probably inevitable. It's, you know, if things are the water levels are rising everywhere. The federal government spent billions on retaining walls, bulkheads, and beaches. They're buying time, scientists say, before flooding makes the barrier islands just too expensive to protect. Mr. MacArthur, you support the National Flood Insurance Program. The Pew Charitable Trust reports that the most extreme cases, that is, repeated flooding, uh, make up about 1% of the actively insured yet they account for about 30 percent of claims. Meanwhile, the program is $25 billion in the red, and as we just saw, sea levels continue to rise. What alternatives do you propose to the status quo? Well, and it's, it's not even just the flood program. The current flood bill, the current flood program exists right now because I introduced the bill that continued it over the objections of my, uh, my committee chairman, but it's critical for this area Sure, there are reforms that would help the program, but flood insurance has to be available, it has to be affordable, and we need a long-term reauthorization, and I fought for that. But there's other issues, too. Uh, I'm a, a co-sponsor of, of the National Estuary Program bill that protects uh, Barnegat Bay, and i am uh, been a big supporter of the Land and Water Conservation Fund that does a lot of reclamation work, and we need to look at our environmental treasure in South Jersey in total, we need to protect the environment around us. We certainly need to make sure that families that are subject to natural disasters have the protection of the National Flood Program. And when I go back after Election Day, that is my number one priority, is to get a long-term bill passed before November 30th. All right, Mr. Kim, one of the proposals to help mitigate the problem is incentives and or subsidies for residents who agreed to relocate. What would you say to those longtime residents who are loath to give up their waterfront property? Well, I just had a conversation just two days ago with a number of families that were still, they're survivors of Superstorm Sandy and still not back in their homes. And as we gathered in an unfinished home, many of them talked to me about the problems that they're facing. And a woman, Nancy, was telling me that she's in this situation where she doesn't have enough money to be able to finish her home, but she also doesn't have an option to be able to get a buyout. You know, those are the types of actions that we should be able to give people options if they, want to, uh, they, if they want to be able to move out, if they feel like that's not a place that they want to be, especially after six years of trauma of not being able to be in their homes. Those are the types of actions, um, as well as other steps that we can take to be able to secure uh, communities, raising roads, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, who is doing the survey, and hopefully we'll be able to speed that up. But it's always about having the community voices in there and making sure we hear voices like Nancy and others who say that they want options for how they can move forward. All right. I want to switch gears to foreign policy now. Um, Mr. Kim, do you think the U.S. standing in the world is better or worse than it was two and a half years ago? As someone who's worked in national security over my career, we always approach these issues of coalition building, making sure we have a strong team. 
when we went forward and, and went against and countered ISIS in the Middle East and in Iraq, we had over 60 nations around the world come together and support us. <clears throat> when I lived in Afghanistan, I was a strategic, civilian strategic advisor to General Petraeus and General Allen. I lived on a NATO military base there, where our partners and our allies were supporting our mission, that they came to our defense after September 11th. Those are the actions of a global leader, building those coalitions, making sure we understand our ties and alliances, and do that in a responsible way that isn't about politics. I always say the last place that partisan politics belongs is in national security. So right now, when I see that our alliances are strained, that we are, especially those alliances that are, are mo most strong, like Canada and uh, European nations, uh, those are issues that make me worry that we're not going to be in a position we need to be able to counter the national security threats that we face together. All right, I'm going to give you a strict 30 seconds, Mr. MacArthur. Better or worse than over the past two and a half years? Far stronger, and I'll take that 30 seconds to say you have been accused by numerous papers of dramatically embellishing resume puffery. Let, let's, stay on, let's stay on the subject. But when you, when you answer... You had the, an opportunity to ask him a question. You got it. Answer this question. 30 seconds, which you Much stronger, but, but when he right says now. he was a strategic advisor to the top general and he was instead in a think tank and the group in general advised, he's puffing his resume and making himself sound like a national security expert. Uh, that, that's a problem. That's the dishonesty that has characterized this entire campaign. Uh, he's, he was given two Pinocchios by Washington Post, David, for exactly this sort of thing, calling himself a national security officer for George Bush when he was an intern and an entry-level position. I All right, Mr. Kim, you want to take 30 seconds? I'm proud of my record in national security. I'm proud of the work that I did out in Afghanistan or in the Situation Room over at the Pentagon. That's why General Petraeus himself said that I served with distinction on his personal staff. So you're incorrect, <clears throat> Congressman. I know you don't understand the different situations and understand. the staffing of general officers. Maybe you would have if you ever visited our troops in Iraq or Afghanistan during your time in Congress. All right, let's um, move on. Um, Mr. Kim, this question is for both of you, but I'll start with you, Mr. MacArthur, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. MacArthur, you're a supporter of the president's economic policies, which include a wide range of tariffs on imported goods from a number of countries around the world, including our allies. Over the past several months, the European Union, China, and other countries have imposed retaliatory tariffs on cranberry and soybean products, both major crops in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. How can you reassure the district's agricultural sector that the president's policies are good for them? Well, I support the general thrust of trying to get fair deals. We've been chumps on the world stage for too long, and we didn't start a trade war with China. They started it with us decades ago. and and. Too many presidents have ignored it. I have worried that the president's going too far too fast, but I think we need to give him room. And what I've found, uh, just last week I was with a company in Burlington County, chemical company. They had a chemical that they could only buy from China, and it was on the tariff list. It was costing them millions of dollars. I went to the administration. I explained it. I got an exception got that chemical removed, and that company is, is now saving millions of dollars per year. I think having strong policy, uh, tariff and trade policy, and then making exceptions, I think is, is a, a winning recipe for this, uh, uh, for this country. Mr. Kim, take 60 seconds on the same question. You know, the, these tariffs are certainly caught a lot of businesses off guard, especially a lot of small businesses. There's a neighbor of my opponents who approached me and told me that his business uh, has uh, taken a 25 percent hit uh, in terms of their industry because of tariffs. Those are the types of problems that we see right here in this district. And what I always want to make sure we do is focus on the American workers, make sure that they're getting a fair deal that we're making sure that environmental standards and labor standards are being fair across the, across the, the, the globe. Um, but we can do this in a way that's strategic. And we understand what the goals are uh, that this administration is trying to achieve. 
And those goals are made clear to me. And I want to make sure that we can operate and you can use Congress to make sure we understand where this approach is going, what the strategy is trying to get towards, and make sure we don't catch industries off guard and have to do a $12 billion bailout to the agricultural industry as a result of these types of actions. They seem uh, not to be uh, done in, a, in the way that we need to be precise when we're dealing with people's jobs and people's businesses. All right. Mr. MacArthur, the U.S. military has been engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan for almost two decades now. Uh, the two wars have killed over 7,000 U.S. military and injured tens of thousands more. Uh, some estimates put the civilian casualty rate at over half a million civilians, with both countries seemingly no closer to peace than when these wars began. Is it time to consider pulling back from these operations, and how do we accomplish that? Well, I, look, I think the, the president has tried to focus efforts. The last president tried as well. These are difficult areas. Uh, my opponent has claimed involvement in that. I, I do wonder sometimes if he put, you know, the JV squad in President Obama's ear, but that was a disaster. The policy of the last administration with the Yazidis, where tens of thousands of them were killed because we dithered, we didn't allow coalition countries to do what they needed with ISIS. This president has made a lot of progress with ISIS. They basically have been wiped off in terms of having a, a physical caliphate. They've been wiped off the map. Why, why wasn't that done when my opponent says that he was a national security expert in that very part of the world? And, and yet we get a new administration with more resolve, uh, allowing coalition partners to do what they need, not micromanaging the Department of Defense from the White House, and suddenly we have amazing results. Mr. Kim, 60 seconds, same question. I've worked on Iraq and Afghanistan over the course of my career, and I approached this as a civilian advisor out in Afghanistan, approached it working at the Pentagon, working at the White House, and that whole government <clears throat> approach is what's needed, that strategy. Having a good team and a good strategy moving forward. And this is something that I'll admit that both sides of the aisle, both uh, administrations, uh, well, the last three administrations have not been able to do in the way that we need. We have now U.S. military servicemen and women who are going to be able to go to Afghanistan this year who were in diapers on September 11th. These are incredible problems that we have, and we absolutely need to be thinking about and have that real conversation about being able to pull ourselves out of these types of conflicts in a responsible way, making sure that we're not the ones carrying this burden. That was the type of effort that we tried to put forward when we're dealing with Iraq, to make sure we're not entering back in and having to carry all that weight, that we do this in a way where we empower partners, build that coalition of 60 nations to make sure that that burden doesn't fall on the United States alone. Those are the actions of a responsible government and a responsible global leader. All right. It's but time for your closing fail. statements, the order of which was determined by a coin toss. Mr. Kim, you're first. Well, thank you so much, David, for having us here. This was incredibly informative to the people of the New Jersey 3rd Congressional District. This election is all about choices, the choices that my opponent made when he it took contributions from pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies and wrote their health care repeal bill. When he was the only member of Congress from New Jersey to vote yes on that tax bill. I've made different choices over my career. I chose to be a public servant, to work under both Republican and Democratic administrations, to volunteer to go to Afghanistan and work in the Situation Room. I also made a choice last year when I was in the hospital waiting room with my wife and were worried about the the health of our baby-to-be, I made a choice to stand up to my opponent who took those actions that gutted pre-existing condition protections in order to score a political victory. I want to always choose to stand with the people of New Jersey, the, my home district, the district that gave me everything. Stand up and protect Social Security and Medicare. Stand up and protect our health care and lower prescription drug costs. And that's why I'm asking for your vote on November 6. Mr. MacArthur. David, thanks for doing this, and I'll talk directly to the voters. Thank you for watching tonight. There has never been a more important time to have people in Washington that are willing to put aside partisanship, work together on real solutions, and solve problems. I said four years ago when I went to Congress that I would be that person, and I've kept my word. I've been named one of the most bipartisan members by independent groups. The Burlington County Times just endorsed me, and that's one of the reasons they cited. 
while I've done th and, and, and we've gotten real results, uh, saved the joint base by working across the aisle together, millions more in funding for, for Deborah Hospital, real progress in, in the worst drug crisis in human history. While I've been doing that, my opponent has been a professional protester. He started an organization called Rise Stronger immediately after President Trump was uh, elected. He organized conventions. He uh, incorporated board of directors, organized marches, stood with Linda Sarser as she called for jihad against this president. That sort of, of partisanship is the last thing we need in Washington. We need people that will work together, and that's what I'd like to continue doing, and I ask for your vote. Thank all right, you. Mr. MacArthur, Mr. Kim, thank you both very much. And thank all of you for watching tonight's debate and all of our Wednesday night debates. Now it's up to you to do your part. And that means getting to the polls and getting out to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. I'm David Cruz. Thank you again very much for watching. We'll send it back to Michael Hill and Mary Alice Williams. Thank you, David. Michael and I are joined at having watched this uh, debate between... Um, Mr. MacArthur and Mr. Kim. We are joined by Patrick Murray of the Monmouth Poll and Chris Russell, who is a Republican strategist actually working on the MacArthur campaign, and Bill Pascrell III, who's a Democratic strategist. Takeaways. Anybody punch through tonight? I thought it was a very civil debate. It's one of the most civil debates I've been to in my adult life. Um, I think for the most part they stuck to the issues. There was a little bang at the end uh, uh, when Congressman MacArthur went at Andy uh, Kim, but I thought Andy acquitted himself well. But, I mean, this is a real... I think this district is a bellwether for what's going to happen next Tuesday. Um, if, if MacArthur's able to hold on, I think that bodes well for the Republicans, and maybe the uh, blue wave uh, will not be as intense. But if Andy Kim wins... Uh, that's going to set the, 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 the wave going west. And this is a tight race. And I think Andy Kim acquitted himself well in his first public debate. And he held his own. Chris, your takeaway? I thought, I thought, I agree with Bill. I think it was, it was civil uh, and on issues. And I think on those issues, Tom MacArthur proved that he's far, far more well-versed on those issues, both in the district and nationally. Uh, I thought he landed some, some good punches in terms of the, the difference between bipartisanship and partisanship. Uh, he's got a record that's proven that. Andy Kim spoke in very general terms about most of those things. So uh, I think a good night for MacArthur, but again, a civil debate, like Bill said. Patrick Murray, what are the national implications of this race? Well, I think uh, quite clearly uh, Tom MacArthur hasn't run away from the, from the Republican agenda. Uh, he's embraced it. Uh, in the sense that, you know, he wants to be part of whatever change is going to happen. I think Chris mentioned this, this earlier. So the tax plan, the, the health care plan. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a district, if he does lose, that, that uh, I think many pundits nationally would be looking to, to say that that was a rejection of that stand that he took in that district. If he, if he wins, then it's the opposite. Um, I think he says that, well, then, you know, Republicans were able to, to weather this. We knew they were going to lose seats. Uh, but they held on to this one with somebody who didn't run away from that Republican agenda. The polling shows, a lot of the polling tends to show at this point, that Kim has a slight lead. But when you factor in the margin of error, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty insignificant. Yeah, this is a, this is a toss-up, um, and it's because of these, these, these varying issues. I mean, we heard a lot tonight about health care. Health care, we've mentioned it every time we've been right. on the air the past few weeks over these debates, is the number one issue. It's uniquely an issue here because of Tom MacArthur's position on the ACA mm -hmm. review. And, Patrick, along the lines we mentioned issue, I didn't hear Menendez's name mentioned <laughs> much, and I didn't hear Hugan's name mentioned much. Yeah, I, that's kind of interesting because, you know, some of the other congressional districts, uh, the Republican particularly, is trying to mention uh, Menendez quite a bit and, and painting him uh, as attached to it. Um, I think we're farther removed in this district than that particular, than, than, than the Menendez issue, and they're really fighting each other. Chris and Bill, let me bring you into this. Do you, well, you, you're all ready to jump. Go. I am. I thought equally interesting was the fact that Donald Trump's name, I don't think, was mentioned by either candidate. Now, right. we knew MacArthur probably was not going to bring Pelosi's. the name up. Pelosi's. They were right. the two right. ghost candidates were not mentioned. And here. so what I think is important as a takeaway is that this district, remember, was represented by Jim Saxon for many years, mm -hmm. then was represented by one term, I believe, John Adler, um, mm -hmm. when he won in the Obama 08 year. That was uh, the and one then it Democrat. flipped back uh, right. to Runyon and, and, and now to MacArthur. 
So this is one of those. It is a Republican district, right. by the way. And for the challenger to be up, and again, with all due respect to Patrick, because he's one of the best in the business, and we're in the business, I say at this stage of the game, polls, schmoles, and here's why. <laughs> the polls are within a margin of error. You cannot take a temperature today right. for what the emotion is going to be going into Election Day. Did we know that the Tree of Life synagogue shooting was going to happen last Saturday? And who knows what the impact of that's going to be? Did we know the 13 mail bombs were going to go? What's the impact of that? Right. So I thought these candidates did well. And I think they were talking to their bases, mm -hmm. but both trying to do the crossover, which is important to win this race. Let me ask you, Chris, about the ballot. There are two names at the top of the, of the state ballot, Chugan and Menendez. They weren't mentioned tonight, but are they going to have an effect down ballot for these other races? I believe they will. And I think we talked about the district being very unique, it's a district that voted for Barack Obama and Donald Trump. Think about that as we think about our politics in the country. A district that would do that really defines what sw swing might mean. So I think in this district, I think Hugan will do well. I think Hugan will do very well, frankly, in, in terms of Menendez. And I think that may be a problem for Kim down ballot, that there's a uh, Trump, as we talked about tonight, not really an issue in this debate because he's so popular in Ocean County and maybe not so much in Burlington. But the Hugo Menendez race on top of this prevents, uh, presents, I believe, a problem for Kim in the district. Patrick, 520,000 registered voters in this district. Um, more of them are unaffiliated, 220,000, I think so. But you know better than anybody else. Um, how, how important is it for them to hear a debate like this for them to make a decision, as, what, as what are they going to decide? Those unaffiliated voters are not on. They're only unaffiliated on the register uh, on the voter registry. Right. They are not unaffiliated in their hearts and minds. They're Democrats and Republicans. The vast majority of them, particularly those who are going to come out to vote, the one th voter that we are looking at that we don't know about in terms of turnout is the voter who only goes out and votes in presidential elections and doesn't vote in midterms. And right now, our polling is indicating those voters are more Democrat than than Republican. If they show up, this is what gives Kim uh, the advantage. Do here. you have a measure yet of early voting and what that's looking like? Yeah, I mean, we, we've just—I think we've just got a report from the state today that uh, early voting has now surpassed uh, what it was in, in, in past midterms. It's going to be a record high of early voting here in New Jersey. We have, I think, there's probably 18 states across the country where early voting has surpassed the total vote in those states in 2014. There's a lot of people who want to vote in this election. Now, by I say a lot, it's not presidential level, but it's certainly going to be higher than any midterm we've had in the So, in Patrick, the has history. it been assessed yet what's driving that high number? The fact that a lot of people got ballots in the mail that weren't expecting them. This was a change in the law that happened in August where anybody who got a mail ballot in, in 2016 got one uh, in this election. I have a student who works in, in the polling institute at Monmouth who got one, said, I didn't want, know I wanted one, but she filled it out and she sent it back already. And that's what Democrats are counting on because we know that from, from the voter registration, Democrats have a 15 to 18 point advantage on the mail ballots. Let me just ask you a basic process question. Are those ballots counted? Is there a certain, certain circumstance under which mail-in ballots wouldn't be counted? Every ballot is counted. Every mail-in ballot, every provisional ballot is counted. The only difference that happens this year with the mail-in ballots, it used to be the ballot had to arrive on Election Day. Now the ballot has to be postmarked by Election Day, and I think arrive within two days later. So, and if we have a bunch of tight races, particularly local, probably even less than congressional, although it could be at the congressional level, but a lot of local races that are, you know, razor thin, we, we won't know the, those answers for a few days. Is your sense that people, though, are voting be, uh, for one of these candidates or, they, or something? Uh, are they thinking Pelosi? Are they thinking Trump? Are they, yes. what, what are they thinking? It's, they're, they're, vote, they're, they're thinking Trump. I mean, that, that's our polling across the state and in all these races is the number one issue on voters' minds is how they feel about Donald Trump. Well, what I like to say in this election uh, is that for Republicans, Trump's not on the ballot. For Democrats, he most certainly is on the ballot. And the question will be the barometer. Democrats in New Jersey are known for the GOTV get out the vote operation. Right. However, because of this gentleman and the great campaign that's being run by our adversaries at the top of the ticket, we are prepared for what we believe will be one of the best Republican turnout models. But we'll meet you in the streets. I think we have a better program. Chris, please jump in. Yeah. Uh, I want the underreported <laughs> story of the year in politics is the chaos that's going to happen on election day, just these <laughs> yeah. ballots. People who got ballots who don't, didn't expect them, who now, if they show up at the polls, will not be able to vote in the machines.
They'll be forced to vote provisionally at the polls, and they're not, they don't know that right now. Many, many thousands don't know that. I think there's been a lot of races on election night not decided until two, three, four, five a week later. Uh, I think that's a big deal, and I think uh, Bill's right. There's going to be a turnout level uh, effort on both sides this year that I don't think the state has ever seen. Well, but we've had, I mean, and, and I know you're not doing this, but many of your brethren are. Let's not scare voters about going to the polls. You go to the polls. If you're not sure if you can vote or not, you make sure you go to the polls. People have bled and fought for your right to go vote. Let's make sure they go vote. And those votes, as Patrick said, will be counted. And by the way, we have provisional ballots all the time in elections. This is not unique. What I think is being referred to is what Governor Murphy did in encouraging a more aggressive VBM process, vote by mail process. But this state is very well capable. We have a very honorable secretary of state who's, who's overseeing election. I have no doubt in my mind there won't be problems, as some will suggest at the polls. Let's check out now some of the online voting in our unscientific poll, Patrick. This is if the election for the third congressional district were held tomorrow, who would you vote for? And there is the result there. Still can vote in this poll. MacArthur there uh, getting some, uh, what is that, almost 70 percent? And Andy it. Kim, about, <laughs> Chris says he'll take it 30 percent. Patrick, of course, yeah. unscientific. Right. And these are always a reflection of your audience and, and the engagement of your audience. Well, I think what's interesting is in the first two congressional races, that, that debates that you held, uh, the, the audience was evenly split. Uh, mm -hmm. On this one, we see a more Republican audience. And that's because I think, think of all the operations, all the Republican operations uh, statewide, the one in Ocean County, the Republican operation in Ocean County is just uh, without parallel. And um, I think that, you, that that probably reflects that in some way. We said campaign finance reform, taxation, and health care were some of the big issues. Another result now, the online polling there. Take a look at this. The most important issue. Can we get that up? There it is. Which of the following issues is most important to you? We see health care is up there, but taxes uh, outpacing health care. You can still vote in the online poll. Welcome to New Jersey. Taxes are yeah, an issue, taxes. right? I mean, yeah. they're always an issue. Mm -hmm. Health care obviously has popped up, like everyone's talked about, for the reasons of Tom's vote and, and just the fact that the ACA uh, repeal. But taxes are always going to be an issue in New Jersey, uh, especially in a district that leans a little bit Republican. Taxes matter. People feel burdened. Governor Murphy's budget raised taxes. It's always going to be an issue. This, this race is tight as can be, as are two other congressional races, two other House races, plus the Senate race. The national implications of those four battleground contests, the Senate race and the three district, three district, seven district, 11 races. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to put the Senate race aside because I'm just not buying this. It's a toss up stuff. And I've said this okay. before. I just I don't. Um, so you, you, on Wednesday morning, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But the, the, the congressional races and we got to include the second in this as well, which which is the the highest rated race to flip in the entire country from Republican to, to Democrat. So there's four races in, in New Jersey that could flip from, from Republican to Democrat. And what we're seeing, particularly over the last week, and Bill mentioned some of the th events that have happened recently, and I'm seeing in our polling just over the last weekend that these northeastern suburban districts that were saying, I like my, I do like my incumbent Republican member of Congress, and these are the higher educated white female voters are saying, but what's nonsense that's going on nationwide, I just can't fathom that, and I think I'll just vote Democrat. Hmm. That, and, that's, and, and New Jersey is kind of the epicenter of that. So, Chris, what does that mean for Republicans, for Republicans in the state? Well, listen, I think, I think Bill made an incredibly uh, excellent point earlier that I think on election night, the outcome of these races in New Jersey will kind of give you an indication of where the nation's going. You know, if Tom MacArthur, Leonard Lance win, Jay Weber, if they're successful, there is no blue wave. In fact, the Republicans could hold on to the House. Uh, if there's some kind of split, I think we're close. If, if all three of these guys lose, there is a blue wave. So I think New Jersey very much is a bellwether for the country. 30 uh, seconds, Bill. I, I agree with that. Uh, if, if the Democrats can't pick up uh, three of the four, uh, you know, if we pick up two, which I think we're going to at least pick up the two, I think the 11th is uh, pretty close to being a, a hard D uh, swing. But we still have a few days to go. If, if MacArthur and Leonard Lance happen to lose on election night, uh, it bodes well. But New Jersey's very different than a lot of these other districts throughout the country. Uh, you know, we are uh, a state that is overwhelmingly Democrat. But 
I do think it is an indication of how suburban voters vote when we look at these other two districts. Bill Pasquale, Chris Russell, Patrick Murray, thank you very much for joining us. NJTV will be on the campaigns and have full coverage of the November 6th midterm elections. I'm Michael Hill. And I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow on NJTV News. Major funding for NJ Decides Debate Night is provided by NJM Insurance Group.